Welcome. I'm uh, Jimmy Shimenti. I work on Iron Ruby, and I will be talking about Iron Ruby. Um, right away, if you want to, you know, if you've got your laptops open, you want to follow along. There's some links you can go to. Uh, you can go to ironruby.net to, you know, download Iron Ruby. You can get the source code from the next link, my blog from the next link, and demos from this talk from the last one. Um, so if you want to see the demos before I give them, feel free. Uh, before I, I begin, though, I should, I should talk about the, um, uh, what do you call it? I guess the, the pink elephant in the room or the 800-pound gorilla, or I, I'm not sure how you phrase it. But um, so John Lamb announced that he left the Iron Ruby team about two or three days ago. And uh, that's not entirely true. He left like eight months ago. He just decided to announce it now. Um, so we've been going strong with him advising. Um, he's still at Microsoft. We, I still see him all the time. He's just working on a different project. Um, but I figured since he's not here to say goodbye, I would say goodbye for him. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, wave. Bye, John. Okay. So let's continue with the talk. So um, this is kind of the outline of my talk. It's probably going to be completely different, like as far as the times go, but whatever. Um, I'm just going to give a brief overview of what Iron Ruby is, what it's useful for, um, why a Ruby programmer would care about it. Um, secondly, I want to talk about Ruby um, and HTML, uh, actually in in the browser. Um, we'll talk about that when I get there. Uh, next, uh, kind of the bulk of the demo will be in, all about embedding. Um, basically taking Ruby and using it either as a scripting language or uh, as a extension language to give to users, right? And we don't see a lot of Ruby being used like that. And um, quite interestingly, it's a big, big scenario for Iron Ruby. And then I'm going to follow up with the state of Iron Ruby, uh, you know, how we're doing, what the roadmap looks like, kind of stuff like that. All right, so what's Iron Ruby? Uh, 186 compatible implementation. It's got some 1.9 features, um, like encodings. Uh, other things are hidden behind the 1.9 flag. Uh, it's not complete at all, so don't expect it to act like 1.9, um, but we play around with things in, in, in there. Uh, it does not support continuations, object space, native extensions, kind of everything you hear from the other implementations, um, except for native extensions. Uh, we uh, uh, you know, the other implementations are, are, are starting to tackle this. Um, local call CC, so local continuations are actually pretty easy to implement when you have a pretty decent interpreter, and we do now. So we're probably going to have local continuations, um, and uh, we're considering FFI support because, like, everyone's doing it. Uh, but uh, because we can't ignore native extensions, right? So uh, that's just what we don't have. What we do have, you know, we have native threads. We have everything you kind of expect from a compiling or jitting runtime uh, that's underneath Iron Ruby. Uh, we run on CLR 2 OSP1 that was released in like 2005 um, and above. And we also run on Mono 2. So Mono 2.4 is out and we've run on Mono since. Um, what's, inter what's also interesting is that there's kind of these browser plugins uh, called Silverlight and Moonlight that uh, kind of parallel CLR 2 and Moonlight 2. Um, and there are very small subsets of it which we also run in. So I'm going to you know, just talk about that a little briefly. Um, and the, the interesting thing about this, which most people kind of don't think initially, is that we run on a variety of platforms, right? It's not just Windows. It's, uh, it's Mac OS through Mono. It's Linux through Mono. Um, Solaris, right? Uh, SUSE, right? Which is you know, completely different. So, so because of Mono, we kind of are able to uh, run on a lot of places. And that's why we really care about running on Mono. Uh, because we're not all about just running on Windows, right? Uh, just look at the room, right? Um, so you know, I, I'm, I'm serious about this. So like you know, 10 minutes before, if you saw me working on my Mac, I was sending pictures to myself because I just wanted to prove that it actually did work. Um, you know, it's nothing substantial, right? But I just wanted to have at least have some proof. So it's installing Active Record. This is using Ruby Gems, and this one is just creating a Rails app. Right? It's really nothing substantial. It's not really proof. I, you know, I figured I wouldn't just want to wave my hand over it. Um, I'm not going to talk about you know how to run um, Iron Ruby on uh, on Mono or on, on Linux. I kind of covered that in depth at OSCON and wrote a huge blog post about that. So please read that if, if you want to know about it. Um, so uh, the bulk of this talk is going to be about what sets Ruby apart, what can I, or what sets Iron Ruby apart. What can Iron Ruby do that most other Ruby implementations um, not not can't, but uh, haven't haven't stepped into that domain. Uh, now. This talk will not be about Iron Ruby being a premier Windows uh, implementation, um, but 
that's kind of the goal, right? So uh, Ruby itself is, is unfortunately not the best performing implementation on Windows, right? And it's getting better because if you use more modern compilers, you can get closer to what, uh, what MRI and, and, uh, and um, 1.9 actually perform like on Linux, but uh, it's still unfortunate and there's some features that are missing. You know, you can't, uh, talking to COM APIs or Win32 APIs are, are pretty difficult and we can do a better job with that in Ruby. Um, .NET, right, doesn't exist. We can have no interop there, so that's kind of where we shine. Uh, you can also think about, you know, using DirectX libraries, actually, you know, you writing games in Iron Ruby. How much of it is, are you really, do you depend on uh, C++ to really get your performance? So, you know, it's uh, things like that. Uh, systems management is another one, you know, uh, uh, writing scripts, right, you know, managing your system. Like, you know, people have been using Python on, on Linux and Perl forever, and Windows people have Bash, uh, Batch, which is, you know, horrible. Um, so, you know, that's another area where we look at. And one of the interesting things is, is web deployment. So, you know, while we do run Rails and we also run some of the Microsoft web stacks, um, you know, we don't really focus on doing that. We make sure it runs. Uh, we wrote a rack adapter to make sure you can deploy on IES. But, you know, no one's really doing it. But the, the thing that kind of woke me up is that um, uh, Matt Almanetti, who's on the Rails core team, kind of mailed me and said, hey, look at the, the wiki uh, for Ruby on Rails. It has 51% of its hits are from Windows. Um, and I was kind of floored by that. I didn't think that was that was even correct. So I asked for more stats, and I wanted to compare it to Mac, you know, the other the other platforms. And it was true. Now I, I don't know how long they stayed there. Right, take that with a grain of salt. But um, you know, it, it definitely there needs to be more focus for the the Windows people who uh, who use Ruby. Um, it's kind of a whole user base that Ruby doesn't touch. Um, the second one is browser apps. Again, I keep mentioning this. This this will be part of the demo and and embedding. Um, so kind of the, the scenario of being po a polyglot where your own application has a mixture of languages, uh, where also you're extending um, this mixture of languages to an end user to let them uh, extend your app with scripts rather than uh, some pre-compiled thing. So I'm gonna talk about those two. The Windows thing, right, you know, again, I know who I'm talking to. Um, I wanna talk about things that actually could possibly work cross-platform and um, are a bit more interesting to what Iron Ruby uh, is for kind of everyone rather than just the Windows developers. So, uh, you can't really see that, but let's talk about uh, HTML script tags. So, has anyone heard of this thing called Gestalt? You ever saw it? Yeah, so raise your hand if you do. So, Gestalt was kind of cool and it, and it caught me by surprise. Not, not because um, I was angry, like, you know, that like someone beat me to implementing that, but uh, because it was done before and, and, and we were told, like, you know, my team was like, oh, we just won't implement it that way. Uh, so it's funny that someone else did it. Um, but so Gestalt basically is uh, um, Ruby and, and Python and actually any DLR language. So DLR is the dynamic language runtime. It's kind of like the LLVM of .NET uh, that we, uh, where we build on top of um, that my, my team at Microsoft uh, built. Um, so the script tags in HTML are, you can write Ruby script tags, right? So you can't really see that, that text. Uh, Ruby script tags, right? And when you run it, it uh, it does what you would expect. As in, you know, why is this so shaky? How do I get through this? Right, when you run it, it does what you would expect, right? It says hello world, and to show you I'm not pulling anything over your eyes, right? It actually is, is Ruby code running there, right? Cooking the event. You can't see that one. So now the unfortunate part of this, um, is this, this, uh, this is all possible because of Silverlight, right? So we're hiding a lot of the gunk that you would normally have to do when you inject a script tag into, or an object tag in your HTML page, um, and hiding it all behind this guy, um, and kind of doing clever things to m make you never really know you're writing, um, you're writing a, uh, a Silverlight application, right? It feels like a browser app. Um, now, you know, for HTML specifically, like I personally probably wouldn't even use it because it's like, all right, well, so for some simple HTML manipulation, like, you know, you could use JavaScript and not depend on a plugin. Um, but like if you're gonna use Flash for something um, or, or, or something where you need more than what maybe Canvas provides, um, this is a no-brainer. Like I would never use ActionScript if I could use Ruby in the browser, right? So, um, you know, the other question is, is of course market penetration, right? So well, I'll talk about that in a second. How many people are actually going to have to install your plugin? Um, but this is kind of cool. So let's just look at some things you can do with it. 
Um, so it's, it's not, you know, it's, you build actual real HTML apps with it. It interops with JavaScript very well. So, you know, if I have, uh, if I have some network connection, hopefully this will work. Right, this is just an app that does some Twitter or uh, Flickr searching and pulls down images and is looking for the H. Oh, I don't have that to show it, but awesome. Yeah. Well, that's what happens when an error occurs. <laughs> uh, and you get a REPL, too. Look, there's a REPL in the browser. Holy crap. Anyway, so uh, uh, it would show you pictures. But th that was kind of not the point of all this. Um, again, I said you wouldn't really want to do HTML apps, but you might want to do, like, you know, cool animations or, you know, vector graphics and stuff like that. And this is completely, uh, you know, possible of doing that, right? So it's kind of cool, right? And this is, well, so this is, these two are actually written in Python um, just because they're written in Python, but, you know, it could be in Ruby as well. Um, so that's really all I want to talk about it. Um, if you want to find out more about it, um, I don't have network. Gestalt actually released a new version of this today um, with a you know, new updated version of Iron Ruby, kind of the Iron Ruby of today and the Iron Python of today. Uh, so um, you know, if you're interested in it, uh, Google Gestalt and you'll find it. But that was just kind of a side note. I really want to... Uh, to talk about um, embedding, right? But let's just, for sake of one more point, um, Silverlight um, is is a little strange, right? It only runs on, on Windows and, and Mac OS, and Moonlight or Novell had to go off and re-implement it to work on on uh, Unix systems. Um, but but they're doing pretty well. They're they're keeping up pretty fast, and Silverlight is not stopping at adding features. So Silverlight four just came out, and it's got some like I I, I was. I was pretty amazed uh, uh, at, at the full trust application part. Um, so basically, with the combination of full trust and notifications and clipboard, you know, you could write up a, a desktop app with it, right? And, and have notifications like you know pop up at the bottom or top. Have clipboard access, access to webcam. And it's pretty nice, right? So you know, imagine writing again like you know like something like an Adobe Air uh, uh, app in Ruby, right? For instance, I mean that's that's pretty cool. Um, and the the kind of other uh, factoid that I liked was um, it was announced that like 45% of the connected internet that uses Mac OS or, or Windows has Silverlight installed. And I was, I was blown away by this number. I was like, that, that's, that's impossible. And then I heard them say it, and I was like, that's insane. So um, the, the, the pickup is, is, is gaining, right? It was like around the Olympics, which were you know, last year or so, it was like 8%. So it's definitely, um, it's definitely growing at a, at a pretty fast clip. Um, so it's 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 a platform to look at, right? And the cool thing is Ruby runs there. So uh, you know, for Ruby developers, that's that's interesting, right? I, I kind of like that. So the uh, that's all I'm going to talk about Silverlight, though. Um, and the next topic is, is this embedding thing. Uh, one of the biggest scenarios for Iron Ruby, especially when it comes to .NET developers. So it's it's <laughs> it. it, it, it it's not like you're taking some crap and wrapping it with crap, right? Like, it's not like you're trying to take, embedding isn't taking, uh, you know, trying to you know, stuff something that doesn't belong in, right? And it's also not painful, right? Um, it's, <laughs> it, 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 we've focused a lot on extensibility um, of, of Ruby in .NET to be very painless. So let, let me explain. So, uh, uh, there's the DLR, the Dynamic Language Runtime. It's got a bunch of parts. Um, the parts that kind of I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are the, the lower-level compiler stuff, right? Um, you know, I work on Iron Ruby. I, I, I very often looking at that compiler code. Um, however, there's also a set of hosting APIs, uh, which let any DLR language that speaks the DLR protocol. Um, they, uh, they can interop with each other, they can interop with .NET code, um, and from C Sharp or VB or any, any other, even from Ruby, you can host any of the other languages using the DLR hosting API. And it's very, very terse, so I'll, sh I'll show you the, the code in a bit. Very, very simple code. Um, so the benefit of this, you can, as an app developer, you embed Ruby in your app. Um, you get extensibility with scripts, which is, um, which, you know, Mozilla kind of has the, the whole, uh, JavaScript uh, uh, 
I mean, the plugin, the whole plugin architecture is mainly JavaScript. Um, but but being able to control it, like in your app, you know, because that took a lot of work, right, for them to embed that. But being able to just make a very simple app and embed in the, your language of choice um, is amazing for extensibility and for just letting everyone, you know, use your app, right? Um, Ruby's awesome in that case because everyone can program in it, right? If you give them, like, you know, just a certain set of things they, they tell them they can do, they'll do it, right? Um, and, and they'll contribute to it in some way, though. They'll make it their own, right? I mean, you know, people write functions in Excel, right? You know, two plus two, right? They write that. You know, it could be as easy in Ruby um, if you were extending your app. Um, but it's also powerful enough just to add features, right? So you could actually build the entire app in this extensibility layer. So you write this little piece that hosts the DLR, and then you just do what you want, right? So the cool thing about this is it builds an, ex it could, you could build an, uh, like an ecosystem, right, for extension developers. You know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, right? We get extensions, right? Um, but uh, it's something that's completely unheard of in the .NET world, and this is why it's so important to us because, uh, you know, people aren't going to stop using C Sharp and VB. So let's uh, let them still use it and, and also use uh, Ruby at the same time. Um, and you know, as a side note, there's there's more languages other than Ruby too. Python, Scheme, and uh, Closure actually run on the DLR as well. Um, so you know, you're kind of letting people pick the best language uh, for for what they're trying to do. So let's uh, let's fix the worst app ever. Um, I've got this stupid app, right? It's, this is, this is it. Uh, you know, imagine someone asked me to build them a, a, a paint program, and I was like, okay, here, here it is, right? It's a canvas and some buttons to add a shape. But of course, I was stupid, right? And I, I made it random, right? Like, you know, they can't actually place it. Um, they can only clear it and add more random stuff. You know, that's, that's a pretty crappy app. Right, so so if I if I was given this, I would be pretty pissed off. But uh, I was smart, right, and I, I actually built some extensibility into the application, right. So there is a window off to the side, which is basically your Ruby interpreter, right. So it acts like your normal Ruby interpreter, where you tell it some math and it gives you the result. Um, it's a little weird that it keeps the text around, right, but that's that was a design decision. You'll you'll see why. Um, you know, you can keep running it, right. So it's a full Ruby, um, you know, it's, it's, it's Iron Ruby right there. Um, and you can also access the canvas over there. So this clear button actually does the same as that canvas children clear, right? And it gets rid of stuff. So, okay, cool. So though this app really sucks, I can actually do something with it, right? I can, I can make it better. So, you know, if you're a kind of semi-knowledgeable programmer, you know what the API is. Um, you can kind of look at code and, and imagine that you could write stuff. So if I have, uh, I have somewhere, of course I'm not going to write this all in front of you. So I have, of course, three, sna three cut snippets. So you know we're adding a square, right? Well, it'd be really nice to like add, you know, as many as you want. All right, so that's cool, right? You can add a hundred for all I want. And cool, great. Uh, so you know this paint program is finally getting a little bit more control, and I really haven't built anything. Right, this this C sh this app is a C sharp app. It's 100 lines of code. It's really easy to write, and kind of if someone the whole point is that if someone's being really stupid, and in, in your you know respect, you can take the app and you can extend it. Right, and it's pretty easy to do. So let's uh, let's let me just show you what that code looks like. Stop debugging here. This is too big. So this is, uh, this is Visual Studio uh, 2010, the beta that just came out. Um, I'm using it because there's actually some special features that let you interop with dynamic languages in it, um, Python and Ruby, um, that are very cool that, that I'll show you. So this is not our code. Here, there you go. So oh, that's interesting. The zoom doesn't keep. So uh, basically, the DLR hosting APIs all revolve around this script runtime guy. That's basically your level of isolation. Everyone see that? Okay, you want a little bigger? No, cool. Okay, so that's that's your level of isolation. You create this script runtime, right? And you also create a script scope, and you can imagine that as just a, a set of variables that are your code runs against, right? So you can take a set of code and run it against one scope, run it against another scope. It could do different things because, you know, this property bag essentially could be, could have different values in it. Uh, the ID fields and the callbacks are kind of a Irrelevant to the to the actual workings of uh, of the hosting itself, um, but that's all you need to do to make an engine. So 
the reason why there's a different a diff, uh, separation between an engine and a runtime is that uh, the runtime is kind of multi-engine, and an engine maps to a language. So in one runtime, you can have many languages. The languages can share variables. They can talk to each other because they do share this similar uh, DLR hosting layer. Um, so this engine is basically now Ruby, and anything we, anytime we use that engine, it, uh, it executes Ruby code. So this line here, engine execute, it gets the text of that code box and passes as a second parameter the scope. So it basically says run this text, be valid against this scope. And then the result of that is gonna be returned as just an object, as, as a result, right? And then the rest of the logic is for you know, doing all the REPL stuff. So that's, that's pretty easy. And uh, the only other thing you, of course, would wanna take care of when you're running arbitrary code is handling exceptions. So if an exception does fire, basically any exception, um, there's an exception operations service. Now the reason why there's this service is because uh, Ruby has its own exception way it displays exceptions, Python has its own way of displaying exceptions. Um, so this lets uh, us uh, kind of publish language specific hosting things through services. And then you just call format exception, give it the .NET exception, um, and it's gonna spit out the, the Ruby formatted exception. And then you know, based on how initialized the world is, I either print a message box or write it, um, write it to a little error area. All right, so that's pretty simple. Um, the rest uh, might be a little strange, so I'll, I, I should move on, and we'll we'll get to the rest of the hosting stuff in a bit. Um, and well, except for this one, you never saw me create the runtime. Um, so this is creating the runtime, and what this does is, you know, because .NET, you know, XML, right? They kind of go hand in hand, just like Java and XML. It's you know this unfortunate world that they live in. Um, there's this whole .NET configuration system, which is based on XML. Um, and we let you uh, define one of those files and then say create from configuration, which will go to the configuration file for the application. .NET kind of has a, a config per app. And uh, it loads the languages. And then the config for this, uh, config for this app is, is uh, you know, for both Ruby and Python, right? Defines Python, defines Ruby. Um, the nice thing about this is, you know, you ship your binaries, you give it to your users. They want to maybe use another DLR language. They just, you know, add a line here. And it's, it's, it's not like they need to rebuild your app or anything. So that, that's the benefit. And then really the only other thing I did, because I said canvas dot, right? How did that canvas get to Ruby? Um, it's because I told it, I told Ruby that, uh, or I told the scope that it should have a canvas, and that canvas should be the variable canvas, right? So I'm just setting a variable on the scope. Um, now you'll you'll see that there's another kind of almost equivalent looking code grayed out in the bottom that I'll get to later. That's the that's the uh, the dynamic feature, right? So you know, unlike this very laid down uh, syntax, you can actually dot into it and set properties like they're field, um, and they just magically appear. Right? They're, they're just set. Let's go back to the app, though. So uh, let's just play around with some cool things we can do. Let's, let's run it again. Again, I, I just printed out some squares the last time. That was kind of not interesting. Um, so I've got some code that'll, that'll render a circle, right? So basically for 360 degrees, but you know every 10 degrees, I create a rectangle, I set it, to be uh, a well-known width and height, um, but a random brush. So brush.random actually doesn't exist in .NET. This is a Ruby method that I monkey patched the .NET method of. So brushes doesn't have random, but I added a Ruby method called random to it, uh, which does pick a random brush. Um, that's fine. I didn't do anything. Um, and then I add it to the canvas and I set its position by, you know, using sine and cosine, basically, you know, the whole, you know, how, how you figure out, right, the, 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 the circumference, right? So, uh, so, so that, that generates a circle. So let's, uh, let's run that. <coughs> 
right, so that I, I, I didn't actually even call anything, so large circle is the function I defined. And there you go, I've got a circle. I, gen I generated a black color there, so that's, <laughs> that wasn't that cool. Um, but, but, right, so like, you know, this program wasn't able to do anything before. Now it can actually do something pseudo interesting. Um, so, I mean, that, that's, that's the power of scripting, right? Um, that, that's why this idea of every app should have a console to it that you can just play around with, right? How many people, you know, played Quake and tried to play with, you know, their, their, their script uh, stuff? You know, games, got, games get this, but for some reason, you know, the, the cost is too high for, like, you know, business applications or just random stuff you do. Um, that really shouldn't be the case, and that's, that's kind of what, what we're trying to solve. So let's, let's continue on down this rabbit hole, right? I'm a very, very hungry, angry user. I want more features, right? The awesome thing is, me, the developer, I was just very smart about anticipating what they wanted because, you know, I get what, like, a paint program probably should do. And, you know, I know they're going to want animations, right? They're definitely going to want animations. So uh, if you saw me when I was going through the code, I had these weird timer classes. Let me stop the build here. That's going to be annoying. I had this, uh, this timer set here that I, that I created, and where's timer used? Uh, my build definition. Timer references. Where's timer used? Right, so I, I, I have this, this lambda that I'm setting to, to the timer, and uh, this is, if, if anyone here doesn't know C sharp, um, it's actually not that horrible. Like, I mean, that's a method, that's, a, that's an event hook. I mean, it looks a lot like blocks, right? And uh, that's a lambda expression in, in C sharp. So it's, it's actually not that painful to use C sharp. I, I, I kind of like it, you know, in, 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 uh, uh, instead of other languages, right? But, uh, but <laughs> who knows what? But so for every time the timer's called, if there's this callback function, I'm going to call it. And it happens to be an action, which is basically a, a lambda in, in C sharp. It's just a lambda that is statically typed to take no arguments and return no arguments. So it takes no arguments, returns a void. That's what an action is. Um, so I've, I've initialized it here, and what am I doing? I'm going to the scope, and I'm asking it for the variable callback. Um, and then I'm setting it to here, and if it is not null, right, in that, that other case, it's gonna run it. So if I define a method callback at top level, it's gonna call that callback every 30 times a second, right? Uh, so I can do some, some animations. So let's, let's copy that circle again, because let's, let's animate that guy. Circle, run that, and uh, what do we got here? Uh, the callback, right? So what this callback does is iterates through every child in the canvas, so basically every square, and gets their gets their position, figures out the rise and run basically of what you would change their position by, and then calculates the, the tangent, right, and, and, and figures out each step where they should be. I, I, you know, I have to remember all my geometry. <laughs> uh, and you run this and right, it rotates, so cool. Like, and that's, that's Ruby being called 30 times a second from .NET. Um, and the, the, the interesting thing to note here is that uh, usually interop boundaries between static and dynamic languages like you know, C and, and Ruby are very expensive to cross. Right, because they're they're native, right, and, and you have to deal with Ruby's VM. In this case, it's the same VM, right? So there's no interrupt boundary. So you can call into Ruby code with like a method, and it's nothing more than an interface uh, um, uh, method call, right? Because that's basically all of the DLR is built on top of calling interfaces, uh, because those are those are fast in .NET, and that's how we do dynamic method dispatch. Um, so Pretty fast, right? So uh, I don't have a way to stop this other than setting the callback to nothing. So uh, that, that should be fine. So I have to iterate through each child here. I really don't like that, right? That, that seems like I could do better. Why don't I iterate through each child on uh, the host side and then just call it 30 times a second for each object? Right? That's, that's, I guess, you know, more of the stress test. Um, so that requires more work, right? Because 
how do, how do I do that? Then I need an interface. Right? Again, you're dealing with static languages. I need an interface, and I need to implement this interface so I can call it from, from uh, the code. Right? I can call it from C Sharp uh, quickly and not have to in incur any extra overhead of trying to look it up. Right? I want it to be a direct interface uh, invo invocation. So this iObject updater is a uh, very teeny interface, right? Just update function, and that's it, right? Um, and that function is going to get called 30 times a second for each object. Um, because if you, if you notice where we were uh, calling the callback, there's then also this tracker maker variable, which basically binds to a tracker method, and that, that calls this 30 times a second for each object, right? Because it iterates through it. So uh, while you know turning the circle is kind of interesting, um, let's let's do something else. Let's let's make things bounce because uh, you know it's if we're going to make this into like a game or anything interactive, I mean you need to do bouncing, right? So uh, I'm just going to copy this code. Um, basically, what it does is it makes an object with an x and y velocity, and then every time update is called, target is basically the object you want to move. Um, it's going to figure out if it's off the canvas, and if so, turn it around in that direction. If it's off the canvas in the other direction, turn it around, and then set its, set its property, right? So it's effectively bouncing off the, the walls of the canvas. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna clear this. I'm gonna do, uh, create myself just random squares, because those seem cooler. Uh, so when this runs, this tracker method is going to be called for every, every object, right? So I run it, and they bounce, right? So every, every time, at 30 times a second, I'm making a new Ruby object, random, random uh, uh, you know, x and y, and, uh, or for velocity, and, and calculating it. So that's kind of cool. Uh, but I, I've actually done nothing to the app, which you notice, right? I, I, I actually haven't added any functionality to the app, right? Because if I, you know, I go back to how I saw it initially, now I just have squares bouncing around, and if I clear them, you know, nothing happens. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, I've really added no buttons. The end user gets no benefit of this, so we should add some buttons. Um, also, what's interesting is that that tracker is still running, right? So as I add things, they start bouncing, right? So that's kind of cool. Um, it's an interesting side effect of it. You get some, you know, in interesting effects going on, right? So, so I can drag things. I can make a clock because you know I'm crazy. Uh, but let's let's just add some buttons. Um, I'm gonna do define. Let's actually, you know, extend this app, right? Because you can imagine I'm I'm the user. I've now created all this stuff. I actually want to uh, uh, want to uh, make it real, right? So you know, might as well extend the interface. So we use this rand squares thing here, which actually doesn't exist, and all that is is uh, is this guy I didn't define, right? Let's, let's just add that in there. And uh, now I'll get some buttons in, in various places uh, when I call add rest of buttons. All right, so now I've got some extra buttons, right? So I can create that. Oh, crash. Awesome. Oh, that, that method didn't exist. That's right. That's very true. We'll continue. Yeah, so it'll tell me I have an error, but I can keep going, right? But this should work. If I define large circle, uh, run that now. That that'll work. Right, so. All right, so it's actually calling the Ruby code that's that's being executed. So anyway, that's kind of cool. Um, the only other thing I wanted to show, which is something I, I, I 
uh, that Jim DeVille wrote for me last night because we went to, um, anyone else go to the Ruby processing uh, talk? That was yesterday? Only a couple people? Okay, so this will be new for most people. <laughs> I won't take credit for it though. Um, they, they showed uh, you know building up a demo in this library called Ruby Processing, right? Which is uh, uh, and they were using JRuby. It was pretty cool. It was a very compelling demo. And I was like, hey, you know, I, I could build that in this thing. Um, so you know, it it seemed pretty basic to say, yeah, I could I could write a um, I could write what they wrote. But I, I thought it was more interesting if uh, you know they would act. I, I would actually use the same API that Processing has and just kind of manipulate my app to run that. So. Let's put this side by side so you can see it. All right, so this was basically the demo that they showed, right? There's some setup method, it does a bunch of things. Um, some, some RGB values in an array. Uh, these, um, these events are significant because they, they map to you know, mouse clicks, that's just how the system knows they're there. Uh, these are just random functions and draw is the thing that, that gets called every tick of the clock basically to uh, draw things. And basically what this, uh, what this app does is um, gets the mouse position and uh, draws a circle there, right? But it only does it when your mouse is, is down, right? So draw on, right, draw off. So if the mouse is down, it starts going, and then once you release, it restarts again, right? So the, the counter gets restarted. So. Uh, Let's run this. And I, I thought this was kind of cool because I took someone else's animation kind of framework and I stuffed it onto mine, which is you have a class, it has this setup, and then it has this update method, which is called for every tick of the clock, right? So I just call the draw one, and you set it up by giving it the type that you say is the type I want to work with, right? And I'll instantiate it. So I, I thought this was pretty cool. Um, so let's, uh, let's run this. This will do nothing initially, right? But if I start moving, right, it does move stuff. All right, so again, it's these random colors. Now I take no credit for the coolness of this, right? Because someone else wrote it. Uh, actually, this, you know, I just ported it to this thing. But I thought that was pretty cool. It was, it was, it was pretty quick. And you know, then the other thing that I thought would be cool is if I kept doing it, kept going, right? I could actually, <laughs> you know, I, I obviously don't clip properly, right? So I can take everything over. Still kind of performing with like thousands of objects, but the cool I was lucky I left that there. <laughs> so then I can do uh, canvas children here to help. Okay. <laughs> and then and, and that's this little app, right? So I've actually made this little thing useful with Ruby. And, and that's kind of cool, right? I, I, was, I, I wrote a very little piece, and then random Ruby code just makes it work in ways that you can't predict, right? This, this app didn't touch any C-sharp code, it was all Ruby. Um, and that's kind of the power of Iron Ruby in the DLL and this hosting, is it's, it's very easy to do. Can you say more specific about that? No. So, um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Can I customize Visual Studio by clicking on Ruby? Um, if you write, so yes. Um, uh, if you write a C-sharp or VB Visual Studio yeah. extension, you can then host the DLR in that and do the same thing, right? So uh, uh, there was a demo that was done at PDC about a year ago where, um, you know, using Ruby to, uh, to click on um, test methods in a, uh, in a um, C Sharp app, and once you click on it, it runs the test. So, I mean, you know, a little, you know, useless demo, but it, it showed that this thing is possible. So yeah, again, it's, it's hostable in, any anything that runs on the CLR, uh, you can host the DLR, right? Because it's it's uh, the names are confusing. It's really not. It's a runtime, but it's not like a runtime like the CLR is. It does code generation, uh, emitting IO, right? It emits the the bytecode. It doesn't um, actually run the bytecode, right? So it's so that's that's that demo. Uh, I don't know if I changed. Um, actually, I want to show you one more thing. So the, the, I have this uh, CLR2 uh, defined, and I, I can remove that. And now, now it's using the CLR4 APIs, and these APIs support calling DLR objects directly from C-sharp. So 
in the grayed out code, let's, let's contrast what they were now. So where I had the I object updater, right, that interface I had to define, I can just call it dynamic now. So dynamic is a keyword in C sharp 4. You're statically typing something to be dynamic. Yes, it's, I, 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 I get the ir irony. Um, <laughs> but, but so you're statically typing this thing to be dynamic, which means when I see this type, don't try to uh, you know, figure out what's going on. Let the method calls happen at runtime, right? And then it acts like a dynamic language as far as method calls, right? So, so if you notice, So instead of getting this element as an I object updater, I'm getting it as a tracker of dynamic, right? So now I can do tracker.update, but I don't need to implement that interface. What this is gonna do is call the Ruby code directly rather than calling the interface, but since Ruby implemented that interface, it's gonna call the Ruby code, right? So, so rather than, an, rather than um, having to define an interface, which is pretty static, right? You don't wanna define interfaces in dynamic languages. You, that's kind of against the whole point. Um, you can do this, and, and the, the app works exactly the same um, as it did before, um, with the same performance, interestingly enough, um, because uh, it's just one slight level of, of indirection here, um, because it's basically an interface lookup. Right? So. And the cool thing is also the, you know, again, you can dot into things and just set them. Right, window and canvas don't exist, but you're making them exist because you're dotting into them and setting them. So, it's kind of cool, right? So, uh, C Sharp has definitely been uh, influenced by Ruby, right? So, you know, kudos to the Ruby community, right? I mean, like, you know, it's seriously, like, like you know, to move a ship like that is insane. Um, so, so uh, it, it's, it's, you know, copying, right? Im imitation is the is the best form of flattery, right? So, anyway. Let's, uh, let's finish up. All right, so state of Iron Ruby. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a while, right? We announced this thing in 2007 in, in March, and uh, uh, you know, we, we've been releasing 0.9.1, .2, and we were thinking of our releasing 0.9.3, but you know, we kind of looked at our, uh, at our goals and realized you know, what we set out to do, we kind of did for 1.0. So, so we're, we're declaring the next release in RC. Um, so it's funny, all the Ruby implementation, you know, <laughs> everyone's deciding to have release candidates. Um, but uh, but um, so we're declaring it in RC. Uh, basically that means we want more people to use it. <laughs> uh, you know, we feel it's, it's ready for, for more use, right? The, and and a, amazingly enough, like you know, in the .NET community, that means something, which is, is weird. You know, people see you throw a 1.0 on it, RC, oh, it must be better than 0.9.2. You look at the patch between the, this version and the last version, it's not, it's not that much, right? But, uh, but um, you know, it's, we're declaring this in RC because we want, we want to kind of push the adoption more to get more bugs and kind of make it to be a, uh, you know, a good implementation. So, so let's talk about performance first. So our goal with performance was to be faster than MRI, definitely. Like, you know, just you can't be slower or the same. You have to be fast. Um, and within an order of magnitude to JRuby. So if we're like 30% slower in JRuby, uh, okay, fine, you know, we're, we'll be okay with that. If we're 90% slower, a whole 100% a whole slower, we should, we should figure out something there. Um, so where are we today? So uh, for the Ruby benchmark suite, um, we're two times faster than MRI on the Ruby installer. So Ruby installer is the new build of MRI against um, uh, MSYS, right? And, uh, and uh, we're six times faster than the one click installer. So forever we were benchmarking against that and then we're like, oh crap, now it's faster. But we were still faster, so it's always good. Uh, but we're one and a half times slower than JRuby, so not within that threshold. So we definitely need to improve on this by, by 1.0. Um, and and this, is, this is just throughput, right? Running, running code, right? Um, now, it, it may be startup too, but you know, because the Ruby benchmark suite we're hoping, you know, from looking at it, it does test only throughput, but you know, it may be some startup things too, because throughput, startup, dynamic language is kind of irrelevant. Um, uh, so as far as startup, just a simple, uh, a simple example, require active support. We're four times slower than MRI, and we're two times slower than JRuby, right? So we know we're gonna be slower than MRI. This is just the way it's gonna work. Um, but we need to catch up to, uh, to JRuby. 
Um, and we have some, we're, we're actually implementing our own interpreter, Ruby interpreter, um, to, to get faster startup. Uh, today we have a DLR interpreter that we convert all of our Ruby trees to DLR trees and then we interpret that. And if we start hitting parts of the code, you know, kind of like tracing, right? If we start hitting thing, things fast enough, we'll start a background thread to JIT that method, that method body or that class, right? We'll, we'll take a piece of code and start jitting it because we know we're hitting that a lot. And then we'll actually compile that. So that's how we make the trade off, right? For, for startup and, uh, and, and throughput. But we definitely need to fix the, the startup wall. So we're not quite there, and that's why we're not done yet, right? But you know, it's it's okay for an R the reason why it's okay for an RC is because compatibility is definitely very good. Um, our goal was we need to at least be 90%. You know, any better, great, um, and, and we're definitely there. So uh, so for Ruby spec itself, um, we're passing it 92% across the board. Uh, you know, like all other languages, we're really good on the language. We kind of suck a little bit more on the core, and the library is a little bit easier. Um, but we're above 90, so that's good. Um, then for libraries itself, just as random examples of things we have in our uh, check-in suite, um, you know, Ruby Gems is passing, everything's passing above 95%, right? Active Action Pack, Active Support, uh, Ruby Gems, we also run Rails, uh, I mean, uh, Active Record Tests, which actually aren't above 90%, but that's because of uh, database adapters, you know, bugs, right? So um, th we don't count that because it's not really testing our implementation, it's testing some other, something else. Uh, and the other goal was kind of CLR integration, right? Kind of what I was showing you, um, uh, but but kind of the reverse. What I was showing you from typing Ruby code and seeing how it how it pops out. Uh, the goal is you should be able to use a majority of the CLR uh, APIs just from Ruby and not have to write C sharp. And we fall over in one scenario there, which is when you need a static type. .NET um, uh, attributes are a good. Uh, example of this. Basically an attribute is a piece of metadata you put on a type that can be reflected over at runtime or at compile time, whatever. Um, and the problem with that is it needs a type to store this information on. And we just, we don't guarantee that every Ruby object is a CLR object, because that would be very expensive and, and tedious, right? So it's okay to ship without that, it's fine with that. So as far as roadmap, today's the RC, we're gonna do more RCs and you know, Basically, if we have no bugs, we'll, we'll finish it. But there is more work left to do, um, especially those 50 bugs, so we should get a work on that. Um, post 1.0, we'll kind of resume this uh, cycle, and we're also thinking of Visual Studio integration after that. It's kind of a uh, biggest, big focus. And it's actually the highest requested feature for Visual Studio itself. Um, there's no other, but the, so this is the highest, and the second highest is Iron Python. <laughs> so it, yeah, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're a seven person team. Uh, let's let's be clear. Like <laughs> that's ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, so we've got a good community. Um, we have a lot of projects that have kind of been popping up and becoming more uh, 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 kind of advanced. Iron Ruby. I talked about Gestalt. There's other libraries there, and these are just a few like things I could fit on the slide, right? So we're happy with the contributions. We're happy with the community, and we're just you know, we're continuing to get help to to go towards one out. So. I'm, I've gone over a little bit, but any questions? Have you run Rails 3 already? Uh, I, no, we have not tested Rails 3. So maybe, but I don't know. Um, uh, we, we test the latest version of Rails. <laughs>